Hello. Uh, really happy to be talking to you today about this topic. I've actually been working on this topic for 20 years, almost 20 years, which is a little discouraging given how important it is, but uh, it's a complicated topic. It's not an easy one. So I, hopefully I'm gonna help you wrap your heads and, uh, uh, and hearts around it a little bit. Um, it's very personal to me, as it should be to all of you. Um, these, little, these little guys here, this is MRSA, MRSA. Maybe you've heard about that one in the news. Uh, some of these others too are E. coli and, and uh, salmonella. Even in the best of circumstances, some of these bugs, some of these staph and E. coli and salmonella bugs can cause disease. And the problem is, and why I'm here today, is that more and more strains of these bacteria are getting uh, more dangerous. And they're more dangerous because they're more resistant to the antibiotics that you need to treat them with if your life's at risk, or your child's life's at risk, or your parents' life's at risk. So how many, how many of us uh, have had a course of antibiotics uh, in the last year or say. Yep, me too. Not, not by choice, I, I tried to avoid it, as everyone should, uh, but in this case, you know, it was really indicated. Um, and more importantly, a lot of us have family members. My dad just turned 95, um, and you know, he's in a facility where they're exposed to more infections. His immune system's depressed, like a lot of elderly people are, like a lot of kids are. And so these vulnerable groups are gonna be more at risk from getting these infections from resistant superbugs. So just to kind of recap, because I'm this is a these are long talks, but I'm gonna try to break it up into pieces. And think of it, uh, if you're like me, you probably do too much. Um, uh, binge watching of Netflix, right? And you have a new series and, and they have all sorts of uh, tricky ways of talking about episodes of a new Netflix series. So think of this talk like a Netflix series. And you know, maybe super, maybe episode one is something like the crisis. Uh, episode two is something like how did we get here? Uh, episode three is kind of the climax in the series. It's where everybody's really despairing and I've depressed the heck out of you because it, it can be a very discouraging topic. But then we start moving towards hope. And so the fourth part, the fourth episode maybe is where we talk about we already know what we need to do. That's the good news. We've known for a long time what we need to do. We just haven't done it. So, um, the hope is that if all of us in this room, if all of us watching at home could uh, really pay attention to the things that I'm going to tell you that we can all do together, we can really make headway against this problem and quickly. So um, antibiotics, you know, I'm, I'm not quite 60, uh, they predate me. Uh, Alexander Fleming, of course, uh, made some of the key discoveries, first of all, with penicillin, and it was an accidental discovery, and that was in the mid-1920s. But it didn't get commercialized. Um, he, in his, he, he got the Nobel Prize in 1945, and he gave a lecture to the Nobel Committee, and he talked a lot about how, how it was really a happy, fortunate accident a mixture of circumstances that let penicillin get developed uh, and in widespread production. And a big factor was World War II. Suddenly they had millions of people who had injuries, traumatic injuries, that uh, many of them would have died if there wasn't this new miracle drug called penicillin. And so the fact that it was a war effort meant that Basically, companies were dictated to that, they, yes, they would be producing this and quickly and getting it into the public domain. Um, I was going back through some articles and I saw this picture 
uh, from the Mayo Clinic proceedings of a young girl, four years old, previously healthy, right around the same time, uh, um, a few years before actually, Fleming got the Nobel Prize. So it's 1943, this would have been a not uncommon circumstance. This young girl's at home, she's got, a, she's got an infection on her skin and it gets dramatically worse. Her fever spikes to 104, the infection starts spreading, her neck and airways uh, are swelling and she's in danger of basically uh, suffocating because this is impinging on the airway. And before penicillin, she very well would, might have died, would have died. Uh, she starts gasping for breath. Now luckily, um, there's this new miracle drug, penicillin. They give it to her, after two weeks, she goes home. I mean, this is by any definition kind of a miraculous thing, and yet we take it for granted, don't we? We can't conceive of a world where we don't have these miracle drugs at our disposal. And yet that's the world we're entering, where the things like penicillin for this girl are no longer going to be available to us. That's why this is urgent. That's why I'm here talking to you. That's why all of us need to be asking what more we can do. So how did we get here? Well. It wasn't just penicillin that came about with World War II. Very quickly, there was a whole slew, a whole pipeline of drugs that got developed. And um, think of these like the low-hanging fruit. Uh, penicillin was discovered from a mold strain uh, after which it was named. And in fact, in nature, molds and other organisms create penicillins. And so a lot of these early, pen uh, early drugs in fact, many of the drugs that we still have today were discovered because they were people sifted through all sorts of microbes. They created petri dishes and they found that there were these uh, antibiotics there for us to take advantage of, basically. So there's a lot of investment, a lot of uh, discovery, trying to figure out how quickly we could get these into use or on the battlefield, in the hospital, in the clinics. And so for a long time, for decades in fact, there was a period where we were adding more antibiotics than we were losing. We had a whole pipeline of drugs, and in fact, people started to say things like, gee, these are nifty drugs, what else can we do with them? And so uh, very early on, you're gonna hear Marin McKenna later, if you're, if you're not here later in the week, I would highly recommend that you hear her talk or look for it online uh, on the chicken industry and how the chicken industry formed out of the routine use of antibiotics. Same with the pork industry. In fact, very early on, the Mayo Clinic cooperated with Hormel, the maker of Spam, to figure out how to use anti more antibiotics in pork production. Very unknown story, but um, uh, in a recent book, I found it fascinating. People didn't think twice about this. They said, hey, here are these miracle drugs, let's use more of them. And that's what we did. The problem with that, though, is that, as you're going to hear later in the talk, using antibiotics is the quickest way to make resistance to them form. The more we use them, the more resistance. And the quicker the resistance comes on. And at first, there was a very low level of resistance to these drugs. And so it took a while for kind of our overuse of them to catch up to us. Well, it's caught up, and then how? So that now, if there is, by some miracle, a new drug being developed, uh, resistance to it comes about very quickly, much more quickly than the first widespread resistance developed. We can talk a little bit more about why that is later. But so that the main points here is that use drives resistance. We've been using a lot of antibiotics for a very long time. Uh, and now we're at a point where we're not creating any new antibiotics, or virtually none. The low-hanging fruit were picked a long time ago. 
Now we're just trying to hang on to the tetracyclines, the erythromycins, the sulfa drugs, uh, the extended spectrum penicillins, um, uh, the cipros. We're trying to hang on to those and keep those effective for as long as possible. But we're in a race against time because quickly their effectiveness is waning. Their effectiveness is waning and we're not creating new drugs. And, and I may get into this a little bit later, but basically I don't think we, we, we can't reassure ourselves that some miraculous scientific discovery is going to happen and we're going to create a whole new pipeline of drugs to bail us out. Probably not going to happen. We may get lucky, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, seeing the weather change and hoping that some huge machine's going to take all that carbon out of the atmosphere for us. It's probably not going to happen. Oh, let me back up a second. So there is this term that's being thrown out there called the uh, post-antibiotic era. It's kind of wonky. What it means is it uh, is a time when we can't depend on antibiotics. And this is going to change not only all of our lives, but all of medicine. So a post-antibiotic era is where we're heading to. Maybe we're already there. Some people certainly think so. Um, but we're at least heading there very quickly. Why, why worry about this? Well, there's a lot of different answers to that question. One is that people are dying already. It's going to get worse, but people right now are dying in large numbers from these superbug infections. And when I say superbug, what I mean is infections caused by these bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. So you, you don't get immune to antibiotics. That's kind of a misconception. Uh, the antibiotics don't get a resistant. What gets resistant are the bacteria. They develop this machinery that makes them not uh, killed or not uh, uh, combated by antibiotics. So you can throw an antibiotic at a, at a resistant infection, it just won't work. And so the person who has that infection keeps getting sicker, and they may die. They might recover on their own, but they may die or be maimed. So right now, unfortunately, we don't track antibiotic use very well, and we certainly don't track antibiotic infections very well. You would think that there was some sort of a central effort to really track how many people are getting sick and dying of these things, right? You'd think so. Not true. In fact, all we have is good guesstimates. And the latest guesstimate from the CDC is that every year we have about 2 million cases of antibiotic resistant infections. And of those, 23,000 people die from them. Now, the CDC is the first to admit these are low ball numbers. These are very, cons they use the word conservative. They, these are very conservative estimates. In fact, one, one resistant superbug alone, MRSA, the one that a lot of us have heard of, at least 19,000 deaths a year. Well, here's the, here's the kind of bad news, is that recently there was a study uh, out of Cambridge Press by some researchers at Washington University, St. Louis. So a very good medical center, um, and a team there said, hey, you know, the CDC, six years ago, came up with this lowball estimate that we have 23,000 deaths a year. We're going to look at those estimates and come up with our own model. So they did, and they wrote a letter, and it got published. Their estimate is maybe more than 150,000 dead a year. Why haven't we heard about this? Why? This is far more than, the, than people are dying of AIDS, for example. Far more. Why haven't we heard about it? Well, because these are largely invisible victims. These are people in hospitals. We're not in hospitals. We don't go to hospitals. Even if you went to a hospital and you picked up their chart, you know what it would say? It would say um, organ failure. It wouldn't say antibiotic resistant infection. Even though that's what's causing the organ failure, if they die and they get a death certificate, guess what? No mention of antibiotic resistant infections. We don't require that to be on the death certificate. 
And so when researchers go back and try to figure out, like, why did all these people die? You know, why is there a spike in people in nursing homes dying? Turns out some of them have these really resistant superbug infections. That's why they're dying. It's invisible, or at least it used to be invisible. It was the old, the sick, the infirm, the immunocompromised that got these. That's changing. Now we have people like Carlos Don, 12 years old, died of MRSA. Rebecca Lawson, 17, died of MRSA. These are young people. These are athletes. They're healthy students who one day start feeling crappy, and a few days later, maybe a week, they're dead. Very scary stuff. If you read between the lines or you read closely around sports, MRSA is something that you find fairly frequently in locker rooms. So a lot of sports teams have had problems over the years. You know, maybe the environment wasn't as sanitary as it could have been, but mostly it's just you know, a lot of sweaty people rubbing up against each other, tackling each other, in a wrestling room having contact, good way to spread a resistant bug. And some of them are getting very sick. Uh, Brandon Noble survived, but his NFL career was over. And this is not, uh, this is not the only occurrence of this. You gotta kinda search for it, but those stories are out there. Death is terrible. I think we can all agree on that. But a lot of these people, even when they survive, they're hugely impacted. Their lives will never be the same. This single dad got a resistant E. coli infection, lost about eight inches of his colon, you know, spent uh, weeks in the hospital. He survived. Who was taking care of his kids? You know, what about, like, what did that do to them thinking that their only parent, that their single parent might not survive? So these are the kind of impacts, costs, that don't get added up.